Hello there and welcome to step 2 in our introduction to the reference designation system series. In this short video we'll take a look at aspects and how to view a system and how that helps us to both designate different kinds of systems but also help us, helps us in our design. So without further ado, please join me. First I want to ask you to take a look at this power socket and tell me to which system do you think this power socket belongs? Is it part of the electrical system or is it part of the wall system? Well, actually it's a trick question because it depends on how you view the system. From a functional point of view, it's very much part of the electrical system. But from a construction point of view, the power socket sits in the wall. How do we handle this? Well, in RDS we handle it by something called aspects. And you're actually quite used to use aspects in your daily life. For example, here I have a model of the public transportation system in Denmark. This model here tells me where I need to be in order to get from point A to point B. It doesn't tell me anything about distance, it doesn't tell me anything about time, but it's very good at communicating one thing and one thing only. If I want to know something about time, I have to look at a timetable. If I want to know how things look, I will look at a picture, and if I want to know how to get there, I need to look at Google Maps. These are all aspects point of view of the same kinds of system. In RDS, we have four kinds of aspects. We have the functional aspects, the product aspect, location aspect, and the type aspect. And I'll go through each and every one of them. So we like to view systems as a cube. And why do we like to do that? That's because a cube has many different sides. And depending on which side we're looking at, we can only see one aspect at a time. So for example, from one side, I can see the function of the cube. From another side, I'll see the product of the cube. Another side, the location. And lastly, the type of the cube. Let's start by looking at the function. The functional aspect is very much a diagram point of view of my system. So it tells me the overall functionality. We normally encounter it here in the PNI diagrams, for example. So here I have a diagram which represents a ventilation system. Please notice here that I can see the overall functionalities of my system and the functionalities of my components. But I cannot see the distance between the components. I cannot see how they are constructed or where they sit in the building. For that, I need to look at another aspect. In another example here, I have a PNI diagram from a power system. And here the functional uh, aspect is very good at dividing the PNI diagram into its functionalities so we can see what's actually going on. For example, in the top, I have an injection system. In the middle here, I have a superheater system. And at the bottom here, I have a separation system. So suddenly I get a better overview of what's actually going on in my power plant. The next aspect is the product aspect. The product aspect tells me how things are constructed. So for example, here in the roof, I can see through the product aspect how the roof is constructed. So it consists of, for example, here the roof construction, which consists of the roofing structure, and lastly the individual beams which makes up the roof. In another example here, if I take a look at the house, I'll find my wall system in here somewhere. And the wall system also consists of a lot of subsystems. Here the wall system consists of the insulation system, electric cable system, pipeline system, and so on and so forth. Please notice that I can't actually see the functionalities of my system now. I do not know to which system the electrical cable system belongs. It could belong to an alarm, alarm system, sensor system or the overall electrical supply system. I don't know, I just know that the cable sits in the wall. The next aspect we want to take a look at is the location aspect. So RDS also allows us to designate the individual rooms or the individual zones of, for example here, an office space. Notice here that I use the space classification now that we find in 81346 part 2. Here I have divided both my rooms and designated them with a class code, but I also have a giant office space. 
And here I have divided into different kinds of zones. So I also have a corridor and actually two office spaces within the same room. Lastly, we have the type aspect. The type aspect helps me to designate different kinds of types. And that's very useful if I have the same kind of components copied many times throughout my design. Instead of designating each and every one of the components, now I can suddenly designate them just with a type. So for example, here I have a heating system. And within my heating system, I find my individual radiators. But for some reason or another, I maybe don't want to designate them each and every one with an unambiguous reference designation. So I can just utilize the type aspect and call them type 1, type 2, type 3, and so on. Here I need to get some supporting documentation to know what kinds of properties and what kinds of type that my individual radiators have. So now we have all the elements that we need in order to create our reference designation syntax. Let's go through them. So first we have our prefix, then we have our classification code, and lastly we have our number. So we already know about the prefix. These represent the aspects. I want to take a look here at the function aspects, so I'll pick an equal. Next thing, I'll pick a classification code. I need a technical system, so I'll pick a two-letter classification code, QM, for example. And lastly, I'll pick a number. Remember, the number contains no meaning, but since it's my third QM in my system, I'll pick number three. This is my single-level reference designation. I can put these single level reference designations together in order to create the full multi level reference designation. Each level contains the same things the prefix, the classification code, and the number. The structure is flexible, so I can address any kinds of complexity that I want. So, how does this look in real life? Here we have an example of just a table view of all of my reference designations and the names afterwards here. Please notice that uh, each and every one of these reference designations are unambiguous and they represent both my high level uh, view of my system and the very components that I also need to take a look at. Now we know how the reference designation system works, but we still need to establish some rule of thumbs and some best practices within the industries in order to create a reference designation that lasts a lifetime. So let's take a look at that in the next video.